Uh, so a lot happened. Uh, the, the biggest one is that the carry trade um, had a deleveraging, which is a lot of jargon. But basically, uh, because Japan has unusually low interest rates, a lot of investors, both Japanese and foreign, borrow yen uh, for nearly zero interest. And then they use it to buy other assets, including things like U.S. Treasuries or U.S. stocks or just assets in general. If you can borrow from a low yielding currency and you can invest in a higher yielding currency, especially one where the currency itself also appreciates compared to the yen, um, then that's a very attractive trade as long as the yen keeps devaluing and as long as that interest rate differential remains where it is. The problem is that um, so the, the yen got so weak in the past couple of years and uh, Japan uh, occasionally comes in and intervenes because unlike a failing emerging market, they actually have a lot of firepower to protect their currency if they want to. They have huge foreign exchange reserves. They have a ton of foreign capital that they can pull back. Um, and so they, they kind of, for most part, letting the devaluation happen. But whenever it gets too quick or too disorderly, they can go in and break you know various kind of speculators and shorts. Um, and in addition, they, they've actually tightened their monetary policy to it's funny, it's only 0.25% interest rates, but it's it's the tightest they've been in quite a while. And the combination of these actions uh, put a lot of appreciation on the yen in a very short period of time, which is a problem for people that borrow the yen if they were over leveraged. And so we got a pretty, pretty massive deleveraging event across global markets um, as that partially unwound. Japan's central bank is playing a dangerous game, one that could send shockwaves through global markets over the past couple of years, the yen has weakened dramatically, and Japan's unprecedented low interest rates have fueled a massive carry trade, allowing investors to borrow yen at nearly zero cost and invest in higher yielding assets abroad. But this strategy is reaching its breaking point, with Japan's debt-to-GDP ratio soaring higher than any other country. The Bank of Japan is struggling to keep control. The recent tightening of their monetary policy though modest, has already triggered a massive deleveraging event across global markets, and the consequences are only beginning to unfold. So a, a couple of reasons. One, it's been weakening because uh, you don't get interest rates that um, are comparable to what you get from other currencies or compared to the money supply growth rate or, or inflation. Um, and so basically Japan, and I, I talked about the subject of fiscal dominance, which is to say that when a, when a lot of debt gets piled onto the public ledger, they uh, countries start running to an inability or they get a lot of consequences from raising rates um, because in a, you know the, the normal reason why a country would raise rates is to either make their currency more attractive uh, compared to other currencies and therefore st strengthen the exchange rate or two to slow down the rate of bank lending um, because that's that's usually the dominant force of money supply growth but there are certain eras where fiscal spending fiscal deficits are a much bigger factor than bank lending. So Japan does not have excessive bank lending, so there's little reason to raise rates in, in response to that. It's mainly about making their currency not terrible compared to other currencies that that people can hold globally. And so they've they've because they have more public debt to GDP than any other country, they're deeper into fiscal dominance. They have much more problems raising rates. And so while almost every other country has raised rates, tried to get a positive real rates, Japan has really pushed the limit on saying, we're just not going to do that. The United States did the same thing back in the 1940s uh, during World War II, as did a number of other countries. It's kind of, you know, repressed interest rates well below the inflation rate and just kind of let bonds and currency inflate away. Uh, for a period of time and the reason that japan was willing to do it is because ironically they want some inflation uh from their policymaker perspective they kind of want to burn some of that debt away um they want to let things run hot because they've, they've historically had some of the lowest inflation rates um they're comfortable with that if anything it makes their exports more competitive competitive now and their main constraint um is it it basically makes their energy imports or their other commodity imports more expensive uh, that's kind of the, the biggest thing that they have to kind of are worried about getting disorderly. Um, and so until it reached a certain point, they weren't really concerned about it. They kind of just let it play out. They didn't want to use their valuable reserves uh, when they're kind of already getting what policymakers want. Um, and they only would use those reserves when it got to a fairly extreme point. And there actually is starting to be some, you know, anger uh, among people about, you know, the rate of their currency debasement, their 
their inability, you know, their their reduction in, in foreign purchasing power and all that. So it kind of finally got to a level where they're not really alarmed per se, uh, but they they be, they did begin to increasingly take actions to slow down or or pivot that that loss. Well, why not try and clear some of the debt? Because it's really hard to. It's on the public ledger. Right. So, I mean, they, they can't really, I mean, they don't really want to default on it uh, because that destroys your your global, your you know, your ability to borrow in the future for a long period of time. And so instead, they destroy it through debasement. Um, basically, if anyone holding for long periods of time Japanese government bonds, your ability to buy almost anything else gradually deteriorates. So they're, they're defaulting on people in very slow motion. Which is generally easier to do than defaulting on people nominally, because then you actually have to admit, admit mistakes. You get all the disruptions, you get all the problems. So instead, you can have a very high credit rating and just keep slowly rug pulling people uh, as long as you can. So Japan actually has less wealth concentration than most other developed countries. Um, so in in their case, it's, it's basically anyone holding currency, anyone holding bonds. Uh, many of them uh, invest in foreign assets for that reason. Uh, but yeah, basically anyone holding um, Japanese currency and bonds basically has this gradual tax imposed on them uh, fairly invisibly, uh, kind of just is, is very mild, slow rug pulling. Yeah, they have one of the, the lowest kind of measures of, of political polarization, um, you know, compared to many other places. Um, they, I actually did a post on social media a while back, uh, kind of when the yen was depreciating at the fastest rate and i was like hey japanese investors here japanese people here uh what's you know how many people there are talking about it what's the what's the chatter like some people said hardly anybody's talking about it other people said no a lot of people are starting to notice so obviously it depends on people's social circles uh you know how, how into finance they are for example uh people certainly notice it uh in terms of imports um and i i've seen this on egypt in a faster scale like I'll go when I'm, when I'm there, I'll ask people like, what do, so what do you think of the debasement that's happening? It's and that that's happening much faster than Japan and where people notice it is the imports. So for example, in Egypt, um, people will be like literally car prices tripled in like three years. Um, and that, you know, it's not like, so like certain things like, like, you know, domestic food didn't really go up or like the rate to hire another Egyptian to do something didn't really go up too much. But when you're buying a computer or a car or even like wood, like foreign made wood, for example, that these things would go up so dramatically and that's where the pain points are. Um, so I, my understanding is it was similar in Japan, just at a slower rate because it's a, it's a wealthier society. Inflation was still fairly low, ironically, um, despite all that debasement. And really the main parts where it can show up are in yen denominated energy prices, commodity prices, which can then kind of trickle into other things. Continuing the discussion, Japan's recent decision to raise interest rates to 0.25%, their highest level in a decade, might seem insignificant, but it's causing seismic shifts in global markets. As Lynn Alden points out, this small increase, combined with Japan's direct intervention to support the yen, has triggered a massive unwinding of the carry trade. The result? A volatility spike in US markets that ranks as the third largest in history, right alongside 2008 and 2020, this is no ordinary event. If you're invested in global markets, especially with leverage, a seemingly small 5% currency move could erase an entire year of profits. Japan's actions are pushing the boundaries, turning what was once a no-brainer trade into a risky bet. Those imports of raw materials are a fairly small percentage of GDP. Right. Um, and so, the, and they're a wealthy society, so they can generally absorb that. And it's less of a crisis than when an emerging market gets like, you know, higher energy mm -hmm. prices in local currency terms. Um, but yeah, if it goes on long enough and gets significant enough, that's when you do get more people kind of saying this is, this is a problem. And then you're more likely to get the government saying, okay, now the risk reward is more in our favor to try to slow this down make sure we don't have like energy costs get too high in yen terms, that kind of thing. A combination, one is that in the past uh, number of months, Japan has been more directly intervening, uh, like FX, like sell, you know, selling reserves to buy back yen. So the, there'll be these big bursts of like money, uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars being used equivalent to um, support the yen. Uh, and this one seems to be triggered by the fact that they increased their interest rates from 0.1% to 0.25%. <laughs> which is still very low, but uh, it's the yeah. highest rate in a decade and a half. Wow. Um, and when a country has um, a, a structural current account surplus and then they're raising rates, they can actually be pretty impactful. 
uh, given how leveraged that carry trade was, how big it was. Um, so that, that seems to have been the, the proximate catalyst. And then there's kind of things that feed on themselves. So for example, if various entities that have borrowed too much yen had to suddenly deleverage, they're selling some assets, uh, which is then hurting other players that might have to then sell those assets as well. And it kind of feeds on itself. In addition, there was a separate kind of mini bubble, which was that a lot of traders globally were short volatility. Uh, basically, they're, they were structurally selling options, kind of like selling market insurance against volatility events. Uh, and so a lot of them got caught off sides by the carry trade, partially uh, deleveraging. And so you get a carry trade deleverage, which then hurt a lot of these, you know, short volatility entities. And so we got the third biggest volatility spike in U.S. history uh, compared to a, a fairly mild event. I mean, the other two volatility spikes were 2008 and 2020. So we had a volatility spike that at least briefly got up to roughly that level uh, because there was these kind of just imbalances, everybody on one side of the trade. So that that is part of it, that basically that, that small numbers matter when we're talking 250% yeah. debt to GDP. Um, in addition, there's psychological trend changes, like you know the, the straw that broke the camel's back, kind of, which is to say that this move in a vacuum might not matter. But when you, when you saw in recent months that Japan is increasingly willing to intervene uh, in its currency market uh, and is now raising rates, uh, it kind of shows that maybe they're not just willing to yet the, let the yen devalue as it, as it was. When it was devaluing for a while, people were like, aren't they going to do anything? And the answer kept being no, not really, no, they're just going to leave everything how it is. Um, but it kind of showed that at these levels, it has gotten you know, somewhat of a concern for them. And so if, if you've been years you know, borrowing yen to buy other assets and you're quite leveraged and you start to see increasing signs that they're going to defend these levels to some extent, uh, a lot of people at once can realize, I want to get out of this trade or I want to minimize my exposure to this trade. I want to, I want to deleverage myself relative to this trade. And like then it feeds on itself. It sounds like an easy trade, but the, the, the risk is whether you do get caught short with it. Yeah, it's kind of... It, short volatility trades as well as carry trades it's kind of one of those things they work until they don't yeah which is to say it, it you know it makes sense to borrow zero yielding yen and buy five percent yielding dollars right uh and it's like why wouldn't the yen keep devaluing relative to the dollar um, but eventually it reaches such an equilibrium point where japanese goods are absurdly cheap on the global market um so it can really benefit their their current account and then you also get more you know, willingness by authorities to intervene. And so you, what was once a very easy no-brainer trade starts to get risky. And if you're leveraged, you know, a 5% currency move can wipe out a year of profits, for example. Um, right. And so fairly small differences can really um, matter all at once.